Hello, my name is Jeff Farbman from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Welcome to another National Good Food Network webinar. Uh, in this webinar, Nonstop, Two Approaches to Direct Store Delivery to Retail, you will hear two innovations on how to scale up local good food in retail. We will hear the story of how a constantly innovating food hub created a program that gets around one of the major barriers to getting local food into larger scale retailers, and how our university was able to partner with a mid-sized grocery chain to prove the value of installing a value chain coordinator directly within the company to manage uh, uh, delivery from uh, farms and hubs uh, to their stores. These are two market-based solutions to expanding good food, and I couldn't be more excited to, sh to host uh, these stories on our NGFN webinar series. So uh, here's a new an updated picture of me, uh, and let me just welcome you uh, and tell you about the Wall Center and the National Good Food Network. The Wallace Center is a business unit of Winrock International, and we are the host of the NGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 30 years. In particular, we are focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. We create national communities of practice around market-based issues, enabling enabling peer-to-peer -peer as well as peer-to-expert communication to ensure efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level, uh, and then back down to the grassroots across the nation. The Wall Center coordinates and supports the network. We work with the growers to ensure that there is an abundant supply of good food to meet the high consumer de demand, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can learn more about the great work of the National Good Food Network uh, at our website, and please dig into our resources, including our webinars. Uh, just visit ngfn.org, and you can always send us an email at contact at ngfn.org. Okay, so let's let's move some food. I'm very excited to introduce Angel. Uh, Angel works uh, with a not-for-profit food hub called Red Tomato. They uh, they have been around for many years, uh, 20 years. I don't know, Angel, will correct me. Uh, and they, uh, as I mentioned, are really continuing continuing their innovations. Um, year after year. Located in uh, Massachusetts, they have a fascinating model uh, which has been profiled in other NGFN webinars. They are an infrastructureless or non-asset based food hub. This means they own no warehouse, no trucks, or anything like that. Instead, they are the logistics and sales and marketing team on behalf of their well-vetted collection of grower suppliers. Angel came to Red Tomato in 2002 as warehouse manager after holding positions as warehouse manager for Boston Baby Superstores and TBI for seven years. While working at Red Tomato, Angel earned a bachelor's degree in finance and accounting at Northeastern University. He is now Red Tomato's director of operations, handling trade logistics, financial management, and internal IT systems. Angel spends free time enjoying his family and summer mornings in his garden, which he calls his farm. Angel. <laughs> Ready to go? Absolutely. Okay. So hi, I'm Angel. I'll be presenting uh, Red Tomatoes Direct Store Door Program. I'll be talking specifically about how we started the program as a pilot model in 2014, and we'll uh, walk you through how it works operationally. So without further detail, I'm going to uh, jump right into it. Red Tomato approached Hannaford Supermarkets in 2014 to explore starting a, a direct store door pilot with 12 of the 25 Hannaford stores uh, within our region. Hannaford was game, so we started to work on the fun part right away. How would we make this happen efficiently with no trucks, coolers, or warehouses? The one thing that we identified at this point were the key strategies needed to make this happen. We needed distribution partners. Uh, that were willing to work with us and, and, and help move the product from ag points to, to uh, help move product from farm to aggregation points and to the end customer. 
we needed farmer cooperation uh, as we have no we're a no bricks and mortar operation so we needed farmer cooperation to consolidate and aggregate orders and we needed a pricing strategy so that we could be competitive uh, with with direct store door pricing uh, to retail and and uh, competitive with what they the pricing that they would be that direct uh, retail would get from their distribution centers so with all the, with with all of those uh, tools in hand, we started we started right away. Um, started to uh, we started with three distribution partners. We had uh, Ginsburg Foods, one of the distribution partners in New York. Connecticut uh, Connecticut distribution partner named Hemingways, and a Massachusetts distribution partner named F and B Fruit. Now that now that we had the tools. Now that we had the tools that we had that that we had defined the tools and the strategies that we felt that we needed, um, we 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 wanted to put in some metrics in place uh, that would that would uh, that we could measure success in the program. So the reason I kept you on this slide is because I wanted to uh, prep you for the next slide is just a picture of 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 uh, some uh, a virtuous cycle of metrics that we figured that we would go by with so many unknowns entering a direct store door program without trucks and the risk and cost involved we wanted to have some metrics in place to know that we were building the program and heading in the right direction with the program so I will use my mouse at some point to uh, walk you through uh, this uh, virtuous success cycle that we made uh, that we had uh, built we call this we call our direct store door program here our plan B distribution our plan A distribution is our wholesale uh, farm to wholesale distribution center um, and so th so we define this program as our plan B distribution so if you look here on the left side here you see that uh, we've got a little legend for this uh, virtuous success cycle um, and we have a the black is the core actions, the red would be the critical limiting factors, and blue were the actions actions defined that we wanted to uh, improve on um, in order to continue this virtuous success cycle. So uh, the first thing we 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 knew that entering into this program, we, there were risk with uh, with with volume and and uh, with with volume and consistency of ordering um, and 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 a lot of unknowns that we couldn't determine on how we would be efficient moving this through other trucks how we would price the program etc so the one things that we knew that we wanted to that we wanted to improve and make happen in this um, program in the pilot phase while we learned uh, what we were going to learn from the program in order to improve it is that we wanted we we wanted to uh, have high customer satisfaction um, we knew that we needed to increase order size we knew that, uh, and, and 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 we wanted to have happy partners. We wanted an ease of business with our with our customers, farmers, and distribution partners. We wanted our farmers satisfaction. We wanted distribution partners satisfied, so that everybody happy in the program. It was like a reciprocal relationship where everybody is uh, everybody's growing along the along the the chain together. So, um, if you look here, uh, we we. We wanted we wanted to have a competitive price, but we wanted to increase uh, quality. Um, we set out to uh, we wanted to offer a wide selection of products, um, and, and 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 wanted to be able to offer those at any given time. We didn't want to be constrained because of pricing or logistics. We wanted a ease of business. We wanted to and and what that meant for us was that we were providing customers with low out of stocks or low to minimal or none. We were aiming for a 95% um, order fulfillment uh, rate, uh, so that we would uh, avoid out of stocks. We wanted to minimize communication among all parties involved. Being a virtual food hub, uh, it's a lot of phone calls and a lot of paperwork that makes all of this happen. So we 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 defined that the people, product managers who are talking to farmers, will be the ones to give all communication to farmers. Logistics would communicate all logistics, and we wouldn't have three or four red tomato departments calling each uh, person for their piece of the deal. 
we wanted to try to just like we do with logistics is do all of that work in the background and then and then uh bring the delivered product uh to the end customer where they don't see all of that all of the madness that we work on in the background we wanted to do the same thing uh with our communication style throughout the plan b uh program or our direct store door program which is which was a way for us to create um efficiencies and continuous this 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 uh success so we figured with uh we decrease price with with all of these factors in place we would be adding extreme value to customers which would improve our customer satisfaction which should and then increase our order size um increase in order size would give us more cases on the trucks which would allow us to increase our basic operating efficiencies um and and uh would give us some satisfied distribution partners as well as satisfied farmers if we can get the good price the volume needed and the market opportunities and provided ease of business throughout the whole program so uh so now so now that uh, once we got through all of, we we put these measures in place and kept monitoring these along the way while we while we built the program and uh and and kept trying to improve in these areas so we had kind of a road map as we learned what we were getting ourselves into and figuring out where we wanted to uh increase efficiencies or or uh decrease communication etc so here's what uh with all those tools in place and the metrics that we put in place to measure ourselves uh this is where we this is where we landed um it's a really complex uh distribution <laughs> distribution that uh when we started in 2014 we were uh connecting to uh 25 we were connecting to 12 Hannaford stores and uh, a, a small amount of independents and a small grocer so what i what i want to do in with this slide is i would like to uh just give you a picture of the of the distribution and how all of this works operationally here um so if you look at the legend to the right you can see that this uh symbol here is uh is is signifying what your uh what our aggregation points are um and i'll i'll identify those aggregation points as we go through it the uh we got our trucking routes and our delivery site so um where we started is our main our main aggregation site uh where the pointer is at right now is plainville farm in hadley mass it was a a, a a, it was a great location, huge farm uh, next to the Pioneer Valley Growers Association, where there's a lot of farms in the surrounding area, Western Mass, uh, where there's uh, and there's also a lot of fruits and vegetables farmers that we currently work with that we we weren't sourcing as much um, just due to our customer demand, and so we were happy to come in here and build uh, this place, um, Plainville Farm. Plainville Farm had the facility, had the space, and had the had the uh, capacity to handle the aggregation and be the bulk, uh, you know, be the be the aggregation point for the bulk of the aggregation of this program. So I'll just walk you. I'll, I'm gonna walk you through the aggregation sites first. Um, I was uh, thinking of the easiest way to explain this to to you is to walk you through the aggregation sites first and then uh and then I'll walk you through the the flow of the truck and how the truck moves over here on the right you can kind of you can uh you can see that this is uh just our order cycle and the way that we manage the order cycle a lot of work goes into uh direct store door distribution a lot of communication especially i could imagine the same amount or close to the same amount of communication if you own your own trucks but even more communication without without the uh bricks and mortar so uh so here at plainville farm um this is a uh, hudson new york uh hudson new york this is ginsburg foods one of the truck and distribution partners i mentioned this aggregation point is plainville farm as i've mentioned this aggregation point is F&B, which is our third leg in our final uh, distribution to end customers, but also an aggregation point for farms in uh, in southeastern Massachusetts. This aggregation point aggregates farms in western Massachusetts. This is uh, Connecticut farms, which would aggregate. This is Hemingway Distributors, where they would aggregate uh, Connecticut um, Connecticut supply, and uh, when in season. We could also bring down Vermont supply into the Boston, uh, the mass aggregation site for uh, for the whole order cycle. 
So, uh, so those are our aggregation sites. Those are where we have product flowing in from various farms. Um, product is uh, coming into those locations, being palletized, shrink wrapped, labeled, all through paperwork that uh, is being provided by Red Tomato, telling growers exactly what to do, what pallets to palletize by store, what pallets to palletize um, by account, and, and, and how to label everything. So uh, now that I've talked to you about the, I've uh, presented the aggregation to you, uh, let me uh, walk you through the distribution. So uh, here, uh, what you're seeing here, this product here would be uh, sourced out of, uh, the, out of Hudson, New York. And so this product is usually picked up um, the day that the truck is going to take off for the order cycle. So if I walk you through, um, I'll walk you through an order cycle where the deliveries are happening on a, on a, on a, on a Monday, Tuesday. So on a Sunday, uh, on Sunday, this uh, Ginsburg Foods would pick up uh, the product that we have on order for this order cycle. Um, on Sunday, it, they pick up this product around 1 p.m., bring it to the, bring it back to the aggregation point um, at the food, at the hub, and get ready for a driver. Keep the product in the cold chain. Get ready for a driver to come in at around 10 p.m. to move the product. Driver comes in at 10 p.m. Uh, moves that product and 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 starts off on the pickup and deliveries for our direct store door order cycle. He pulls up at Plainville Farm around midnight. There's uh, nobody there. There's just a self-load open warehouse, um, clearly palletized and labeled product for this trucker. He comes in, self-loads his product. If he needs to drop product there, he would, but most of the time just picking up, self-loads his product. And, and uh, by that time, all of this all of this product would have already um, arrived here on Sunday by 4 p.m. If we if we had Connecticut on the order cycle, this product would have arrived here by 4 p.m. Um, uh, on Sunday, the before this truck gets there at midnight. Um, same thing for uh, for for Boston. All the product would have arrived here from other farms. Would have would have arrived at this aggregation point in Massachusetts um, on Sunday or Saturday, so that when uh, when our truck arrives there Monday morning, as he's now here at midnight, now he's moving towards the Massachusetts aggregation site. It's now Monday morning. Um, as he gets here around 3 a.m., he uh, he will uh, drop off product and, and uh, pick up product. Uh, so as he picks up some product, because the driver here is going into the market to deliver to our end distributor that delivers to, I want to say right now we're delivering to about 37, 45 locations. This guy delivers to the bulk of the locations. This truck will deliver to three or four of those locations. So as he comes in on Monday, he hits this uh, distribution, picks up the trans exchange product, um, he takes what he needs. They take what they need. He, uh, the the Ginsburg truck runs off um, on his way back home. He'll he'll deliver to three or four stores, direct store door. The product that has arrived at this aggregation site goes directly in the cooler. Um, we have a, a guy that'll pull all that product apart. Their warehouse staff give us a count. Um, so that we have a cross check and we know that all the product has arrived. If we need to make any adjustments to invoices for delivery, et cetera, we make those adjustments, um, get them back to paperwork because they just received all of this on Monday. They give us our cross checks on Monday. We get clean paperwork, communication to customers on Tuesday morning. Monday night, these guys are staging our product. Tuesday morning, the product goes out to all stores. Um, so that's 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 how we handle the current distribution, and there's so many unknown factors as the sourcing, the amounts of sourcing, the volume, the consistency coming from Connecticut to pay for the Connecticut leg that gets it here. All of those those are just variables, and you can't really predict how all of that part is going to work. So where we felt where we felt pain in the program um, after after running it of uh, through 2014 and 2015 is we we felt a lot of we felt the most pain in our gross margin um, we at red tomato we aim for we operate on a 10 percent gross margin of sales um, and for this program we we wanted to be able to we didn't want to be constrained in our plan a program we our margin is calculated within the pricing structure for all items 
Um, and so, so the trucking is calculated within the pricing structure for all transactions. So therefore, we, we're guaranteed almost a 10% um, because we've, we've planned it at the worst case scenario of, of shipping volume. But when we're in this, uh, but for this program, we, we told ourselves that we were going to price this differently. We'd do a 30% markup from the farm price, and we would put the pressure on ourselves to fill the trucks to be able to have that 30% cover our, our shipping plus give back uh, a 10% gross margin, which is what, which is the 30, between 18 to 30% is what we know in our experience that, um, distribution centers are marking up the products that go to cover their overhead before they get it down to the retail. The second place where we felt pain was on staff timing. Uh, there was, uh, just because there was, we, 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 we had a distribution software, but there's so much detail and systems and so much cross checks and paperwork in order to make sure that all the data is communicated clearly and every, every party knows what they need to do for every order cycle. Um, and every, and there's no extra cases floating in an order cycle. So we want to make sure there's no mispicks or shorts. So there's been a lot of time in just getting systems, um, updated. We have a distribution software. We're working with developers to get customizations to get that stuff updated. Also, our staff capacity. So we've added two new staff to uh, to work on this program. Um, and so just a just a bunch of things. Um, just a bunch of you know, as we're learning, it's a pilot phase, and we're building the model. Just a bunch of learning, and the admin um, brings back. There's a lot of admin when there's a lot of shorts and discrepancies. There's a lot of bookkeeping work that needs to be done. So there's a lot of staff time and going into the program um, right now, and we're working on improving those, improving those, making them more efficient. And I will explain to you how we're looking at um, we're we're looking at some other models that will improve. Um, all of these places where we felt pain um, in my future slides. Uh, the last place where we felt uh, we felt pain was in scalability, because um, as I mentioned previously, we had priced this model at 30% from farm price. Um, so we were in in that in that plan. We were our, our plan to ensure that we would gain in our 10% gross margin was that we would need to fill those trucks. We would need to go back to that virtuous success cycle and continue to improve efficiencies throughout that supply chain so that we can start to see uh, filled trucks, which we felt that with filled trucks, more volume going into the third leg uh, distributor, that we would usually more volume means less uh, less transportation costs. Um, but that wasn't the case in this program uh, just because for our for our first two legs of distribution we have uh, we, we have a fixed cost for where there the the more volume less uh, less cost that that uh, that works there on the first two legs but on the third leg of distribution which goes out to the bulk of, of all the stores um, we don't have uh, more volume means more cost because we have a per case price there as opposed to a per pallet price on our on our on our first a per truck price on our first legs of distribution when we get to the third leg we got we 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 have a, a per case cost of three dollars per case to deliver which uh and, and and there's some outlier stores that aren't in the realm of where that current distribution company is distributing so there'll be some extra order minimum costs tacked on to that so given uh given all of given all of that um i can show you how on my next slide i'd just show you just how the performance of the program did um for us uh, for our gross margin uh, so in 2014, we had 513,000 in sales at a 3.11% gross margin. And uh, in 2015, we increased sales by about 200,000, but still uh, didn't experience much change in margin. And mostly uh, this is due to the uh, to part of the there's all the variables about like what portion of product is coming from Connecticut, et cetera, but uh, mostly due to the the uh, added costs or, or not able to gain efficiencies through volume on the third leg. So 
So before I go into this slide, I just want to explain uh, what. So what we're doing, what we're doing right now, the what we, what this, all this work has led us to explore right now, um, as we've been thinking about the the best way to to manage this program, is that uh, we're exploring a cross stock model with the the Hannafords, who's been the biggest partner of the customers in this in this program. We're exploring a cross stock model with the Hannafords uh, stores, where where uh, we still would like to be hold the whole supply chain and take the orders directly from the stores, um, get the feedback directly from the stores, but we want to have all of this product aggregated at our main aggregation facility and picked up by trucks or trailers that will bring discrete wrapped pallets, maybe in a fluorescent shrink wrap that screams local, 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 so that uh, when they that takes those discrete wrap pallets and brings them directly to a distribution center. Um, at the distribution center, when they open that back door, they know local has arrived. They can see those color pallets and they know not to unwrap or touch that product. It's a cross dock. It comes off that truck and onto the trucks that are going out to the stores. Part of what led us to getting to uh, exploring this model is what we know from historical data from working on these direct store door models. Um, and so what we've run into from time to time from various direct store door models that we have done in the past um, is that when the, the, when the warehouse buying opens up the buying for direct store door to the, to the retail um, uh, stores, there, there. It doesn't seem like they're coordinating the buying volume together. So when the stores are ordering a lot of, you know, they're ordering a bunch of local potatoes and tomatoes, and and uh, and the warehouses, uh, they're they're still buying based off historical buying. Maybe they're factor in to cut back a little for for the DSD. But what happens is the warehouse starts to run long on the products that they've purchased, like um, a ton of potatoes or a ton of tomatoes. Or peppers, when they run long on those products, they don't. They they do what they call as a force allocation, where they send out those products to those stores, whether they ordered them or not. What that does is it slows down our our order volume. Um, it 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 cuts into our order volume because the stores aren't going to order the items that are being force allocated. So if one of those items is one of our anchor items, that puts even a bigger dent into our distribution and makes distribution even more inefficient. So what in this model that we're exploring, we would be cutting out that third leg of distribution. We would have product consolidated and aggregated at Plainville Farm. Uh, and then we would have two trailers picking up product that would take product in discrete wrap pallets out to the New York Hannaford warehouse and another truck out to the main Hannaford warehouse. That product would get cross docked onto their trucks so we're streamlining with the current distribution system that product would go on their trucks and go out uh, go out to their retail stores if there were any questions on quality or credits we would deal with that directly for the store but what we would get to is we would be providing the same local program uh, local regional program with over 300 SKUs of fresh produce harvested within 48 hours from uh, in the store within 48 hours from harvest um, and provide them to all of these accounts so <laughs> with all that being said uh, these are the customers our current state right now these are the customers that we're currently delivering to uh, in this program. We're delivering to about uh, after 2014. We did, although it was a pilot, we we uh, managed to keep all of our internal pain internal and and worked really well and had happy uh, distribution customer distribution partners, customers, and farmers at the end of 2014. So in 2015, uh, Hannaford's increased and we are now serving 25 of their locations with the opportunity to serve their uh, New Hampshire some more of their locations uh, that are out of our reach right now but they so we're serving 25 of those Hannafords we're, we're serving about four of those Donnellan supermarkets a longtime customer since the beginning of Red Tomato uh, we serve about 10 to 12 institutions uh, Northeastern University including uh, my school uh, through the Chartwells accounts and uh, and we're serving in uh, two to three independent, um, just small independent grocers that um, have have come to us for the direct store door delivery. 
in my last slide here, um, what you see is uh, this is this is where uh, where we get the gratification for all the work that we, that, that it takes to run this program. And so uh, from this is a uh, infographic from 2014. And so what you're seeing here are the uh, top selling items that we identified in 2014. And that corn helped us out so much because there was good trucking in there. So that helped us out a lot with margin. Um, if you look on the second row here, you're seeing uh, this is where I really get my joy from. Um, these are uh, pictures of the farm stand display that Hannaford does uh, puts out in their stores when the local regional product is in season. You could see some red tomato peaches, squash, peppers, an abundance of items from various growers um, in Massachusetts and uh, all, all, all delivered on one truck. Uh, and so you see in the middle there some of our point of sale materials because we also we we provide the whole program for our customers and we're trying to differentiate the commodities through through point of sale materials through uh, through explaining growers best practices and also through um, through just uh, through through just connecting the consumer uh, with where the product is actually coming from. Uh, the third, the third, uh, the third row of this, uh, what you're seeing is that we started the program with three key distribution partners and learned that uh, as we were learning and trying various things, we uh, were luckily to have a bunch of distribution partners and we had to call in uh, three others at different times just to bail us out because for one reason this drug this truck couldn't drop at this location so we had to drop at a close location get the stuff shuttled over all of this craziness while we figured it all out and even uh, one day when the truck left the whole order behind we went in and delivered it ourselves in the van so <laughs> um, and uh, yeah so that's uh, that's a picture of our DSD program Great. Thank you, Angel. Um, I, I said, Angel, make sure you get into the nuts and bolts. So he, he did that in spades. So I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, You're I'd like to uh, introduce Rebecca to tell you about a, a quite, quite a different setup. Um, Rebecca Dunning is a sociologist and agricultural e economist and is a research assistant professor at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, or CEFs, at North Carolina State University. She specializes in the social and economic aspects of food systems and food supply chains. Rebecca leads the center's work to strengthen the economic viability of small and mid-scale food producers through research activities and engagement with business entities across the food value chain. She manages the North Carolina Growing Together Project at North NC Growing Together org, a five-year USDA-funded initiative to link small and mid-scale producers of produce, meat, dairy, and seafood into grocery and food service supply chains. So very much what we're talking about here today. Rebecca's work with Lowe's Food on their DSD program has been part of that work for sure. Today, we'll, she'll talk about how a university begins a partnership with a mainstream food business and the unique role that universities, including extension services, can play in supporting the farm to grocery store value chain. Rebecca. Hi, thanks, Jeff. So the perspective on direct store delivery that I'll share over the next few minutes is from the standpoint of a third party that's working to facilitate market relationships between small and mid-scale farms and retail and wholesale outlets. In this case, the third party is the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, or CEPS, a partnership between NC State University, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, and NC A&T University. In 2013, CEPS began a USDA NEPA supported initiative called NC Growing Together. It's through this project that staff at CEPS built a relationship with the regional grocery chain Lowe's Foods. Krista Morgan, who is staff both for NC Growing Together and for Lowe's Foods, will fill in more on the nuts and bolts of the DSD program at Lowe's in a few minutes. I'll describe CEPS initial contact with Lowe's, the origin story of that relationship, talk about how DSD was selected as a strategy to develop supply chain links, and I'll briefly cover the kinds of activities that product staff engage to execute that strategy. Lastly, I'll talk about a few things that we learned along the way. First, one quick orienting slide on Lowe's Foods. Lowe's Foods is a privately owned North Carolina grocery store chain based in Winston-Salem, which is about two hours west of Raleigh. 95% of its stores are located within North Carolina. Merchants Distributors is Lowe's Foods Regional Warehouse Distributor. MDI 
serves both Lowe's and other independent grocers in the Mid-Atlantic. It's located about an hour west of Lowe's headquarters. Lowe's and MDI are, are owned by the same umbrella company, and while they collaborate closely, they do function as separate business and profit centers. So what kicked off the relationship with Lowe's Foods was outreach to Lowe's to become a business member of the NC 10% 10 campaign, which is another SEFS initiative. By joining the campaign, Lowe's pledged to strive to purchase 10% North Carolina grown products. Soon after that, Richard McKellogg, who was and remains the local food champion at Lowe's, reached out to Steph seeking an intern to help work on a local program. That fall, Ariel Fugate began the internship. And by spring of 2013, Ariel had transitioned into a shared staff position, half time with the North Carolina Growing Together Project, half time as Lowe's Foods first locally grown accounts representative. The work that she began continues on under Kristen Morgan. So really the story here, uh, that initial contact growing into a relationship, I think is to have a low risk way for a business to work with you, you being the third party organization, and for the third party to share resources with that business. In this case, the first resource was the opportunity for positive marketing that Lowe's could use as a member of the 10% campaign. Then this grew into an internship. That's a valuable resource for a business when properly managed. Not everybody wants to have an intern. There's very often in chain grocery stores and other businesses someone, a champion, who both sees the business sense of sourcing more local product as, and is intrinsically interested in doing so, but given the demands of their regular work, they just do not have the bandwidth to spend the time on it. So third parties can fill in that need. So we've got a relationship going, and the prerequisites for that relationship are for the business, there has to be a business case. As a family-owned regional chain with historic ties to North Carolina, Lowe's could see that these ties and making this apparent to its customers would be a smart business move. You have a business champion who shares an objective, and you have a project staff person, in this case, the locally drawn accounts representative, who can focus on working closely with business to achieve that objective. An important point to make is that the objective needs to be shared in this case, bringing source-identified products from small and mid-scale growers into stores, but the ultimate goal of each partner can be different. Our project goal is not the same as Lowe's Foods' goal, but we agreed on the objective and we could work together to achieve it. One thing to mention is uh, meetings, meetings with your business partners. Uh, when we have a meeting with Lowe's or any of our other partners in NC Join Together, it's um, narrowly focused on achieving how we achieve the shared objective. For Lowe's project staff uh, from NCGT have very frequent contact with Krista, the locally grown accounts representative, and less, front, less frequent contact with the category managers at Lowe's. A good strategy that we found when approaching a new idea to work with um, at Lowe's is to approach it as a pilot. We can pilot something, we can see if it works, uh, we can support that pilot with our resources. M most, uh, usually this is our time. Sometimes pilots are proposed, they take months to even begin, sometimes they die on the vine, you have to circle back around a year later, and in the meantime, you may need to pivot to something else. So the DSD work was really an example of a pivot. The original idea in 2013 when NCGT started, that's NC Drawing Together, the idea was to move more source identified product from small mid-scale farms through segregated slots at the warehouse to stores but a business case could not be made for that. It was high cost and high risk from the business's standpoint. So we pivoted to building a local program by bringing more growers into direct store delivery relationships with one to several stores. Now this slide is just on produce and I just show it to give you a sense of how quickly the number of farmer vendors and participating stores can grow. 2012 was the baseline, our pre-project year, and you can see over time the growth in vendors and in stores and in the type of product. In 2012, Lowe's had four large fruit vendors, blueberries, apples, peaches, delivered to a fairly large, fairly large set of stores, about a third of their stores. And thus the expansion over time really came from adding diversified small and mid-scale produce farms. You'll see a little bit of leveling, leveling off last year, partly due to the fact that it was a tough growing season and also Lowe's desire to rethink how product was being ordered. And I'll touch on that again in a minute. So what does a third party do to support a robust VSC relationship? Provide time and structure on the buyer side and the same thing on the grower side. 
the creation of a simple, streamlined vendor inquiry form, copies of which are available in stores and on the NC Growing Together Project website, and a single po point of contact in the form of Krista Morgan, makes it fairly easy for a potential farmer vendor to make contact with Lowe's and find out if they're a good fit for DSD, for the warehouse, or neither. NCGT project staff also provide structured venues for growers and buyers. Lowe's is one of those buyers, but also including other partners in the NCGT project. That's a time to meet face-to-face. -face. We also hold hands-on post-harvest handling workshops where both farmers and wholesale buyers are in the same room. So this provides peer learning and business networking. And we include stops at the grocery store in conjunction with grower meetings and conferences. So the idea is to bring growers and buyers together in as many different venues as possible. On the vendor side, we do the same thing. The third party provides time and structure. The third party organization can also leverage time, meaning it brings in the time and expertise of other affiliates, such as cooperative extension, and creates applied and practical tools. For example, while there are very nice wholesale specification guides out there, we created a small 20-page guide, particularly to NC crops, that gives retail and packing specs that are specific to our retail partner Lowe's and to NCGT partner wholesalers. You'll see that I have the same three photos here on the side, and that's just to stress the point that what you want to do is to bring all the parties, the category managers at the corporate level, as well as store managers, produce managers, staff at the store, all of whom can have an influence on purchasing directly or indirectly, bring them all in contact with growers. The last thing, a few things that we learned along the way. One thing we saw was that it was important for stores, store managers, produce managers, employees to be aware of the local growers who were delivering to their stores, to know them personally. This is really key. But it's very hard to grow a program to include more farmers with more types of crops if the stores are the ones that have to be in direct contact with the growers for every order. It's very difficult to keep track of. And what happens is that it no longer makes business sense to expand the number of farmers or local products. So there is a need to centralize ordering above the store level, while at the same time making the farmer's presence known in stores. Over the course of the project, some farmers increased their volume and ended up going to the warehouse or delivering to many more stores. But some growers really just want to have one or two nearby stores, maybe to supplement their farmer's market work. And if they're delivering a high quality desired product, that works. Just as there is varying interest across growers and selling to stores, there's varying interest across store managers. For Steph's work with Lowe's, we had a project champion in the main office. That's enormously helpful. But if you don't have that, it is possible to work at the ground up, meaning at the individual store level. So by that, I mean having shoppers asking store managers for particular local items that they know are grown in their area. Where are the local strawberries when it's the height of strawberry season? And the third party facilitator, like Extension or others working directly with growers, should meet and occasionally check in with store grocery managers. So that if the opportunity arises, say the store wants to have a local food event, the manager knows who to call. These single events can turn into market relationships. It's important to realize that the people you're working with in the store are operating under a number of constraints. Systems are set up one way, and if you want to change them, you have to make the business case, as I said before and offering tangible third-party resources can help with that business case. We learned that our assistance with marketing materials was not needed. Uh, more messaging was seen as clutter. That won't be true in every situation, of course, um, but you need to explore and clarify that at the beginning of the relationship. Lastly, a pitch for third-party organizations to be that helpful third leg in the relationship, which I realize now is a really weird way to put it, third leg in a relationship that's weird, but what I mean by this is that the third party can really be important in beginning and supporting the robust relationships between grocers and growers. It can act as a resource provider. It provides time and structure, technical assistance, and opportunities for networking. Thank you very much. Uh, for more information on SEFs and NCGT, please see our website, and I'd love to communicate with others that are doing similar work. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, uh, some great questions have been entered. I want to uh, renew my encouragement to type in your questions as they occur to you. Uh, Rebecca really presented a great example of a university providing the right environment to encourage significant business to happen. But uh, this is an excellent role for 
not-for-profit entities too, uh, and even local government can uh, fill this role. I mentioned this term earlier, but I want to repeat it here. CEFs is acting as a value chain co coordinator. They are creating the environment where new market relationships are born. This is an incredibly important role for uh, expanding good food, and um, CEFs is uh, really doing a great job. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce Krista, but unfortunately, uh, she is not able to join us. So uh, Rebecca is uh, going to uh, slightly alter her voice and pretend that she's Krista. <laughs> Krista has, uh, be because she knew this might happen, um, she has uh, written out her, her notes. So uh, Rebecca is going to present uh, as Krista. So magic, magic. All right. Now Rebecca is Krista. And <laughs> Krista Morgan is... Yeah. <laughs> the locally grown account representative at Lowe's Foods and liaison for NC Growing Together. Her career has been focused on food and farming. Graduating with a BS in horticulture from North Carolina State University, she started NC State's campus farmer's market. She has traveled to Costa Rica to study farming there and worked at a plant nursery as an administrative horticulturist. Her internship at the Old Salem Historical Museum and Gardens is where she learned that she wanted to work with farmers rather than as a farmer. So uh, Rebecca, as Krista, will now tell us the ins and outs of her current work at Lowe's. OK. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I will read this as if I am Krista. Um, okay, we'll get on here. All right. Um, first, uh, just a little background on the company. Alex Lee is uh, Lowe's parent company and is owned and operated by the same family that started it in 1931, based in Hickory, North Carolina. Merchants Distributors is our sister company, also based in Hickory. MDI is a wholesale grocery store distributor that supplies over 600 retail food stores with food and non-food items. Lowe's Foods was started in 1954 as a retail side, and the home office is in Winston-Salem. Lowe's Foods has around 75 stores in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. We're adding stores each year. There's also 25 Just Safe stores that are operated by MDI. Logistically, it can be tedious and time consuming to manage which stores are ordering directly from which farms and how to decide which stores the farm should deliver to. I take a number of things into account when selecting and scheduling vendors such as an individual store's demographics, their sales volumes, store size, location, the desires of the product manager, whether or not it's a remodeled store, et cetera. We support over 200 local vendors, which includes vendors associated with Food Hub. Many of the warehouse vendors also DSD to our stores, and many of them started out as DSD vendors. That is what I would consider a success story, when a vendor starts as DSD and gradually becomes a warehouse vendor. DSD provides them a market for their produce and ability to expand their operation. Some vendors are 100% happy being DSD vendors, and that's okay too. This map also helps me see where we need more DSD vendors versus a saturated DSD market. The map also helps me see where I have a blueberry farm in one area and may need one in another, so we aren't overlapping vendors with the same item. Each potential DSD vendor starts with this application. The application covers contact information, farm information, food safety requirements, liability insurance, and other information that we gather to help make our decision. After a vendor completes the application form and all questions are answered, a farm visit is scheduled. This is required before any official decision can be made on becoming a vendor. DSD is a wonderful option because it allows us to be flexible with every vendor we work with and figure out a process that fits the needs of that particular farm setup. Because every farm is unique, DSD can be a very tedious, time-consuming process from start to finish because of all the details. This is one of our sweet potato and strawberry farms. The farm has been with us for years, and just this season, the father passed the farm onto his son, Cliff. We've enjoyed working with and supporting a young and upcoming farmer who has learned through growing up on the farm. He is one of our many success stories who started DSDing to two stores close to him, is now delivering to our entire Raleigh division and is working on scaling up to start going to our warehouse, probably next season. The reasons Cliff has been so successful are his ability to maintain relationships with the produce managers at each store, to attend grower-buyer events, he pays close attention to his pricing versus market price, and he chooses his produce items wisely, and he stays up to date on all current food safety certifications. 
Kiko is a, form, is a farmer owned food hub that focuses on local and organic produce. Their business model has made sourcing DSD easier. With one contact, we have access to the produce of 12 to 40 farms each week. We receive a bi-weekly availability list and are able to easily order an assortment of North Carolina goodies. Then ECO takes care of aggregating and delivering to each of our stores. ECO has made a few warehouse deliveries because they're also able to supply the volumes that are needed for the warehouse. We're also working with ECO on our first local and organic pallet promotion. They are DSD mixed pallets to 21 of our stores. If this promotion is successful, it provides a way for higher volumes and a larger variety of produce to be bought from, brought from local farms to stores in one order. The quantity of product on the pallet also provides stores with a nice looking local display. So uh, as an uh, insertion here, this is similar to what Angel was talking about earlier with the mixed pallet um, direct from the from here we're doing it direct from the farm to the store, and then it can just be put right into the store as a great looking display. Also, because of this promotion, through this promotion, product is delivered direct, directly to the stores from the farm, it gives a better price to the stores and the guests. This is happening as we speak, and we are anxiously awaiting feedback. DSD allows you to work with vendors other than produce. We have a separate application for grocery items, deli cheese, and, working on a, and we're working on a meat seafood application. The major difference between the applications are the food safety requirements for each. Randy Lewis is one of our first local DSD dairy vendors. He is currently in six stores and delivers weekly. The benefit for him is that he doesn't have to go to a warehouse and pay the same slotting fees as the larger milk companies. He also has a unique product, cream top milk, and guests aren't accustomed to that yet. So we're able to carry his product and educate people to build sales. One of our most successful social media posts was a video we shot of Randy and his farm. More on that later. Our remodeled stores have been equipped with community tables. These tables are constructed with reclaimed North Carolina farm wood, some from old tobacco, farm, tobacco barns. The community tables have events each day. The events could be craft making, highlighting a product in the store, a recipe demo, beer tasting, the list goes on. It's a great way for guests to learn about new products and vendors and get extra attention, especially to local vendors. In-store tastings have proven to be one of the most important factors in building sales. There's a distinct difference between the sales of a vendor who consistently participates in demos and store events versus vendors who haven't stepped foot in the store. So I always encourage all vendors to participate in as many as they can. Tastings are how every major brand has gotten to where they are now, and most still do tastings themselves. Participating in store events and tastings is also a great way for a vendor to maintain a relationship with the store and managers. Showing up for these events shows the stores that you are helping support them, just as they are trying to support the vendor. It's a win-win for both sides and is always appreciated. This is Lowe's version of a community-supported agricultural box, the CSA, and we are on our fourth season of this program. The Carolina Crate is another way we source from local growers. They deliver directly to one location, a packer in Salisbury, North Carolina, who then packs the boxes, delivers to our warehouse, and then the boxes end up at the Lowe's food stores every Friday morning during the season. Even though the Carolina Crate does spend time at the warehouse, it's less than a 48-hour turnaround from when the box is packed to when it gets to the store. It's great to be able to buy from a variety of farmers, but also to place a large order consistently each, each week for 12 weeks of the summer. We're also able to purchase specialty items you wouldn't normally find on a grocery store shelf. It's like bringing the goodies from a farmer's market to the grocery store. Not everyone has a time or is a morning person to grab all the goodness out of farmer's market. Each Carolina crate has at least six to eight varieties of produce and no subscription is required. We've started doing, a, doing farm profiles on our social media page. My goal for this is for guests to make a better connection between the farmer, the product, and learn a little too. Some products can only be explained so much through a sign, and these videos give a better glimpse into each individual grower. So it's a wonderful marketing tool for the vendor. Also, it's been an excellent traffic driver for our social media page and website. When you post materials that your followers are interested in, you don't have to spend as much money to make sure people like or share it. The video on the left we boosted with $100, and the video on the right with $60. These posts outperform many of our posts that had plenty more dollars behind them. But this concludes um, Chris's portion of the website, and I just wanted to add, I'll 
one additional thing about the social media um, is that it really it drives people not only to the stores to buy products of the local vendors, but also to other venues where local vendors may have their products. So for Cliff at C.D. Pilsen Farms, for example, he, he um, has his product at farmer's markets, also at a farm stand. So if someone sees him at the store, they see him on social media, they may go into the store and buy his product. They may decide on a Sunday afternoon they'd like to go out to his farm stand. Maybe they'd like to go to the farmer's market and, and see this famous uh, Cliff Pilsen. So it really, it really works to use the social media to drive traffic both ways, to farms, to stores. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Uh, so uh, let me open it up to, uh, to questions here. Um, and uh, please, again, feel free to, to write in questions. Um, and um, I'm going to, I'm going to dig right in. Um, so uh, a question for Angel, um, and I, th I think Rebecca, you'll you'll be able to approach this too. Um, what factors did you use to decide uh, which distributors and farms would be good partners or aggregation sites? So in the in the in the case of Lowe's, more like supply farmers. But um, Angel, you want to take that first? Uh, how you how you decide on your uh, supply yep. logistics partners? Yeah. Well, we we were looking just depending on customer demand. We knew what supplies we needed, and then we knew that um, part of the reason our our supply our supply chain is spread uh, from you know sourcing from Massachusetts down to New York and Pennsylvania is so that we can uh, we we learn that to be in the marketplace we have to provide a you know to for ease of business we need to provide reliability um, on our products. So we were we wanted to make sure that we had uh, lettuce supply in both parts of the region and a lot of the items in different parts of the region, so that we can, so that we can, uh, so that we, if if the if if our growers couldn't get in the field to harvest tomatoes this morning because it was raining, we could offer that customer tomatoes from New Jersey while the Massachusetts tomatoes, you know, come in for the next harvest. So that was one of the factors is just, you know, supply and sourcing or where we where product was moving from. Also, uh, other thing we were thinking of is just uh, a centralized location that was easy for all farmers to get to, for a lot of farmers to get to, um, so that we can aggregate our, our, our product. Products. And then on the on the third leg with the distribution partner, uh, the third leg distribution partner, I knew that in order to get a distribute, in order for us to run distribution direct store door through a metro uh, metro mass area, we were looking at we were metro Boston. I'd say we were looking at. Um, we needed somebody who had a current distribution model already in those areas because it was not going to be efficient for us to 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 hire uh you know to 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 just hire somebody to say okay you're going to put two three four trucks on the road for us and those are just going to be just for you're you're putting those trucks on the road just for red tomato we're going to pay you for the truck in order for us to get a third leg that could distribute that give us a per case cost so that we could deliver three to five cases when it was ordered we needed to find a distributor who currently had a distribution system in the metro in in the metro uh Boston area that was that has a fleet of trucks that are currently out there so that uh, so that in order for this all to work um, so those those were kind of some of the factors I'd say we were factor in our supply um, and in location of aggregation point as well as um, as well as uh, distribution partners who could who 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 this system would kind of work for, um, that it would be able to be efficient because it wouldn't be able to, I couldn't see us running um, the direct distribution with a company that doesn't have any distribution out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, uh, Rebecca, do you want to talk about choosing farms and supply partners? Oh, did we lose Rebecca? Are you muted, or did you fall Hi, off? Sorry, oh, I there we go. Myself, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I can reflect just, just a little bit. I mean, what I've seen over time, you know, over the past um, three and a half years, you know, starting with Ariel, who you know was kind of there in the beginning, is that um, 
and then which farmers stayed and which farmers, you know, kind of did DSD a couple times and fell away. Um, a lot, if they if they're already selling at a farmers market and they have a good history of selling at a farmers market, then they usually will be uh, pretty good to deliver to a store as long as they ha can keep that keep the product cold because it's not necessarily going to be sold the next day. So that becomes uh, very important. So um, bringing the product that you know the grocery store manager who receives the product from the local farmer says this this product looks great, but then we'll talk about you know the next day the squash exploded. So you know you have to have you know make sure that the the product has been chilled. Also, a uh, grower should keep in mind that you know they're going to have um, they're going to be selling at a farmer's market very very typically a small misco grower selling at farmer's market they're going to make 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 it a nice retail price. And so when they're a little low on product, they the first thing they're going to want to do is to not supply the grocer. They're going to want to take all their product to the farmer's market, but that's going to really mess up their relationship with the grocer. So it's really finding growers that are consistently willing to supply, you know, what they promised that they were going to supply um, within reason. You know, um, stores know that things happen. So mm -hmm. that's what I could say. Mm -hmm. Stability is really important. Um, Rebecca, do you feel like uh, this model is suitable for smaller markets that don't have uh, that don't buy at the same level as chain grocers? To do DSD? Mm -hmm. That's, I would say absolutely. I mean, I would say absolutely. I mean, a single grocery store or a set of four or five grocery stores could have three partner farmers and working, you know, close collaboration with those, especially if the farmers, you know, they, they focus on each focus, specialize in something slightly different. Um, and that could work great for everybody. And one thing to, to toss in is that, um, you know, it's not just that a buy from local growers because of the quote unquote local product, you know, for that. It's also because of fill in a fresher product in between warehouse deliveries. So, you know, keep that in mind that that's another mm -hmm. selling point. Uh, you know, it's not we, we you know, we on out they think, oh, it's a marketing thing, it's a local product, but it's the fill in so they don't have to hold inventory. You know, there's other business reasons. So, yes, I, I do think it would work for smaller situations. Good. That's, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Um, Angel, uh, as as an external uh, entity, uh, you had to get some uh, initial projections from your buyers. H how did you, how did you get those initial projections? Well, the way the way that so we the way that, well, I was going to jump into our other side of the distribution, but we, we the the initial for the Hannaford stores. We once we were in communication with them about about. Um, you know about running the pilot program and getting started when we gave them we gave them a, a list of availability of what we could provide um, the, we had one champion at Hannaford's that was working with uh, Laura here on on the planning side and uh, they they gave us kind of a uh, they gave us a sense of, of what the orders should look like coming from those stores and then we talked to them as well of what kind of minimums we'd like to see like a 10 to 15 case minimum per drop um, it's really unrealistic to get to guarantee that it was hard for them to even get to a 10 case minimum per drop but uh, we but putting that that guideline in place allowed us to kind of keep them aiming for that 10 10 case minimum so that um, so that we can make the drops more efficiently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so let me stick with you, Angel. Speaking of efficiency, you, um, on your you, you mentioned a, th a three percent or so gross margin. Does that mean that your the net for this project, the the DST Plan B, uh, is actually negative? The yes, on well, w not negative. We were we 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 made. We made three percent, uh, a little over three percent, just close to four percent gross margin on on the entire program. Okay. So there were there were a lot of transactions that were that were um, there were a lot of transactions where we earned negative gross margin, um, and it's all and we were okay with that at the beginning because we were really uh, we were really just trying to learn um, all of the all of the ways that we can improve and, and what we do. And so at the our go our main goal for the first 
first two years was to make it work and and be able to uh, to to bring this abundance of produce into the stores on delivery and show them that we could do it to show them what a local program would look like. Now in year three we are we we're changing uh, we're changing a few things in order and we're exploring other models of uh, because we've learned so much now we're exploring different ways of handling this so that we can uh, gain the efficiencies that we can and we're also thinking of this um, going forward for the long term long scale for Red Tomato is that we're thinking of this as kind of a marketing tool as a way to crack into these distribution um, <laughs> centers or wholesale customers and so uh, in our experience I've been with Red Tomato for 15 years and in my in my experience we've always everything everything where we enter with a local program is uh, less than a load um, about two to four two to six pallets you know start end of purchasing and sometimes it grow, it could possibly grow to half a load but we're not moving up into uh, you know trailer loads of, of, of items so um, with this uh, yeah we, we're looking to uh, I lost my point, my train of thought there, um, but but we're looking we're looking to increase. Uh, we're looking at different. We're exploring different options in order to in to increase the efficiencies in logistics. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Rebecca, Marguerite uh, is looking to set something up uh, s similar to the Lowe's project, but. Uh, but hiring a third party to help work with growers uh, to start up, similar to the the intern idea that that you started with, um, she's asking for some best practices to consider uh, and any key job description points you might have to suggest. Hmm. Well, um, I, I was reading that question, and, and Marguerite, I'd be happy to talk with you offline because um, it's probably a longer conversation. You know, for us, it was. We, 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 you know, being staffed, acted as the third party and then the, the intern and then, you know, our kind of shared staff was actually, you know, working with Lowe's half time. So first, you know, full time as the intern. So it wasn't as if we hired someone who was, you know, kind of outside of the company who would then visit the company. So it was a little bit different. Um, so it's hard to give a it's hard to give a short answer to that. It's a <laughs> sure. great question. <laughs> so um, I mean, well, yeah. Well, I mean, what I'd like to do, I think that's a really great question, is um, is to think about this a little bit, and I'll chat with Krista and Ariel, and you know, come up with like a job description um, for what you're talking about, and we'll post that on our website because that's really actually a great question. Oh. And on the website, um, someone also asked us another question. Someone said would. Lowe's be willing to share its vendor application, and that is on our website. So the vendor application is up there. If you go up under the to the ncgrowingtogether.org uh, resources for producers, the NCGT, you, you'll see Lowe's vendor application. And for Marguerite's question, I'll get something up and post that to up under our for advocates educators uh, resources. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, I'm glad David asked this question. Um, how, uh, because price is always an issue here, uh, how do the margins or prices of locally sourced produce compared to, quote, factory food suppliers? Is the end consumer paying a premium uh, for the local produce in North Carolina? So what we see, I mean, what we see in the research kind of, what, you know, Lowe sees, the grocer sees, and research bears this out, is that in the grocery store setting, uh, consumer, you know, the shopper will pay no more than about 10% more for something that's, you know, marked as local next to something that's not, right? And that's, you know, that's what we've seen. So the in, what what Lowe's does is typically will pay the grower what they would pay the warehouse. So what the grower gains is um, that margin, that in between percentage of markup that the warehouse would put onto it. So typically the the products are not going to be priced higher. Um, they although the you know depending on season, depending on the product, they might be slightly higher than the warehouse price. Um, if the cantaloupes are much larger and more beautiful than the options at the warehouse, then the individual the managers can price them a little bit more highly and pay the grower a little bit higher than the warehouse price. But that's not not typical. And I mean one thing to keep it just to keep in mind is that. And this brings it to the, you know, the business constraints that you have to keep in mind is that 
you know, in a chain grocery store, you know, they're advertising in a circular that goes, you know, across the state, across all the stores, a certain price for certain item, um, like green peppers. So if one store, one store can't really charge a different price for green peppers and thus can't really pay a different price for those green peppers. So that's some of the constraints of, you know, working with a chain grocery store. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great point. All right. There are several other great questions. I apologize to all these folks who have uh, entered these great questions, but uh, I want to be respectful of time. So I'm going to uh, thank Angel and Rebecca and wish a huge good luck to Krista. Um, it's really my sense that uh, many of you in the audience can see yourselves in one or both of these stories whether you're a farmer or a retailer looking to expand your local food offerings, if you're a food hub, if you're a value chain coordinator, and really as consultants or other supporters of good foods, uh, good food, sorry. Uh, so many of us buy so much of our food through retail outlets. Creating systems that work for the retail, their retailers is critical to our work. Uh, and having these successful case studies is excellent food for thought and lots of fantastic detail. I think it uh, should really help uh, with implementing. And I'm sure you've all written down uh, Angel and Rebecca's um, uh, email addresses uh, so you can contact them with uh, further questions. Although, don't abuse it. Um, we uh, have our National Good Food Network webinars on the third Thursday of each month uh, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. Sign-up links are always posted on ngfn.org slash webinars, but uh, make sure you get on our mailing list to hear about our webinars first and to reserve your virtual seat. Um, if you... Uh, if you uh, would like to view the recordings of all of our archives. They're also there at ngfn.org slash webinars. I mentioned that uh, the Red Tomato uh, case uh, is up there. Uh, we also have uh, some more information about uh, value chain coordinators um, and uh, local food and retail. Lots of, lots of great stuff to, to dig into. Uh, related to this uh, this webinar. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, uh, Twitter, our website is ngfn.org, and the Wallace Center is on Facebook. If you search for Wallace Center at Windrock International, uh, we are there. Uh, if you um, will fill out the uh, post-webinar survey, that would be uh, fantastic. Uh, you can sign up for our, our, um, our email there um, and just let us know uh, what you thought of, of the webinar. Um, we, we offer our webinars free, uh, but it's, uh, it's important that we get uh, feedback to uh, improve our, our webinars and also to report to those who foot the bill. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right, uh, this concludes the webinar. Thank you.